I was more angry than hurt because I know we could have played better. I know we didn't prepare ourselves like we should have. We played the entire game. We lost six nothing, but I was happy how my my brothers kept fighting. The World Series of Stickball or the WSS is an event that's held at the Choctaw Indian Fair every July. And it's the main event when it comes to stickball. So, you know, here in Oklahoma, we have different tournaments. Um, we have different tribes that you know, host these different tournaments throughout the year. Um, there's some even down in Texas with the Alabama Cachada. But, you know, the WSS is different. World Series of Stickball is, it's on a different level. And it's, it's competitive, you know, it's two weeks long of stickball. So their fair starts off with stickball and their fair ends with stickball. It's really cool to go and watch the, you know, be there getting ready for the championship game. And they have some, you know, big hit country singer. And then all these Choctaws just get up and leave right in the middle of their performance because that big game's about to start because that's what's important is that stickball game. You know, who's gonna, who's gonna win that year? Who's gonna take that trophy? Who's gonna take those, you know, those bragging rights? It's amazing to see all this, uh, all these indigenous people, all these Choctaw people come together and just celebrate what it means to be Choctaw. It's fall in Oklahoma, which can only mean one thing. The Tushkahoma men and women's team get back to work. Coach Jared Tom will run the players through some skill work and game type situations. Choctaw men and women travel hours just to practice. The hurt. The injuries. The fatigue sets in. But in the end, it will pay off. Tushkahoma, which means Red Warrior, and Tushkahoma Ahoyo, which means Lady Red Warriors, both had a great practice today. The origin of Choctaw stickball goes really far back. It goes farther back than any kind of written history. A lot of the, what we know about those games are documented a lot of times from French, um, Spanish, um, and so they weren't always paying attention to the cultural aspects of the game. So they were enamored by the, the athleticism and just the, the, the awe of watching a game. And, and 
this idea of, of playing a game was so serious to them. You know, they, they thought this was just pastime and didn't realize how it was connected to our, our stars, our creation stories, all those things in place in those ball fields all had a, an integral part. The preparation for the stickball game was uh, just like uh, the preparation for war. You know, the men were tasked with protecting the community. And if it wasn't a time of war, the best way for them to stay you know, fit is to take part in things like stickball. We had ceremony with the, with the game that was, that was tied to it. And so the clan mothers or different ones would start games, bring out the games, depending on what the game was being played for. So if it was a little brother of war game, it may have been over a, di a diplomatic dispute or a dispute over territory, hunting ground dispute. I mean, it's always called a little brother of war. You know, yeah, if your family, two opposing families had a fight or argument, you know, that's how it was settled. You know, it was through a ball game. And instead of going to war, having all these, all these warriors dying, they created this game. But it was also used as a way for entertainment and a way to bring, to bring together the community. You know, they would come together as a community, sharing food, breaking, you know, breaking bread with one another. The game was one of those places that would bring people together. And so um, they would, you know, uh, get together, they would fry a hog, you know, for two or three days, the whole family would get together, grandmother, everyone would come and camp and play these games. And so that was some of the early stuff that we have recorded. It talks about the, the beginning of the game. Every year, the Choctaw Nation holds one of their most exciting events, celebrating the year and our culture, the Labor Day Festival. Meanwhile, at the stickball field, players are signing up to compete in the annual tournament. The road to the finals. You heard it here first. The road to the finals. Teams from the Chickasaw Nation and from Mississippi all compete in this three-day event. It's a game of heart and community pride. Tushkahoma feels like they're ready. Before our, our game, we'll gather together I'll pull defense, we talk about what we need to do. <laughs> Taylor, where you at? He's starting. Oh, man. That'll be able to cover that whole side. We're doing a lot of running. And I try to focus on the game, who we're playing. Which ones? Or what defense needs to be done. And after that, I'll walk through, talk to every player. Do work, play your game. slip through our hands, but that's okay, like I tell them all, all the time, that uh, we never hold your heads down, you know, no matter what happens, we celebrate, because this is a sacred game, uh, this is something that belongs to us, it's a part of our culture, so win or lose, we always win.
Despite falling short of the team's goal, there was one moment that took place on the field that may have just summed up the team's purpose. Okay, next one. Okay. Okay. Good job, boys. Good job. Good job, Tesco. I've been playing this for 32 years. One thing I'm going to tell y'all. Y'all coming up. Y'all keep it up, and one day y'all might be like me. <laughs> but anyway, y'all did pretty good. <coughs> keep working, keep working. I'm glad y'all stopped playing. When I heard that, I said, well, at least our lost brothers are playing. <coughs> y'all don't know, we all brothers. Somehow down the line, we are. I don't know, grandma might have been my great grandma. Because mm -hmm. this is what I always tell my people back at home. Can y'all buy these at Walmart? Pawn no, shop, no. yeah. might, <laughs> But already made brand new and don't buy it at Walmart. When I play, it's our medicine. But the medicine is being done from a tip. What I always do is I'll pray for it. What I want to do is I want to give a little pray for it. But I'm going to say it in Tata. Because mm -hmm. your first language is what? Tata. And your second language is what else, right? I'm going to say it in, a, in our language, okay? MBCI from Mississippi would win this year's tournament. The Tushkahoma Ohio team was just hours away from stepping onto the field. Um, my name is Melissa Sam. I'm Choctaw and I'm also Mojave. I'm a senior here at Northeastern State University. I am majoring in mathematics with a minor in accounting. I've been playing recreationally about four, about four years. Um, I didn't start playing with Tushkahoma until um, last year. 2017 was the first year the Choctaw Nation sent a women's team to compete. Melissa Sam would score their lone goal. In the fourth quarter, I remember that toss up and I remember them scooping it out of the huddle and there was no one around me and I saw my chance and I picked it up. It was, it was a clean pickup and I just ran with it and I just, I remember just seeing me and the pole and I shot it and it hit the pole. It was a point. That was probably one of the most adrenaline rush I've ever experienced. It is now time for Tushkahoma Ohio to take the field. When those drums start beating and they talk about the drum being the heartbeat of the game, you can feel it. You had to mentally prepare yourself. Or we were preparing, you know, we were getting our sticks ready and we were preparing to go to war.
another Labor Day tournament in the books. Yeah, we got center, defense, and shooter. Um, shooters, of course, they're the ones that score. Um, and, you know, he's one of my shooters. Um, Carly, she's out there. She uh, she coaches our, our centers. They're the ones in the middle that, you know, make sure the ball advances to our shooters mm -hmm. um, if the defense can't throw it all the way. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's we play on a 100-yard field, that field over there. Okay. Hey, this team. Shooting that way. Shooting side. Hey, look around and see who's on your team. You cannot believe I cannot believe And our defense, of course, their job is to protect the pole on their side to keep them from uh, from scoring, and you know, they're they're usually the heavy hitters. You know, so if you get the ball and you're down there around the defense, you're, you're probably going to get smashed. <laughs> so there's, some, there's some big old boys down there. Just shoot the ball. Yeah, get the ball, the ball, shoot it, shoot as quick as you can. And so they play with the two poles. Yes. Um, it, it's, you know, we have one team guarding this one, one team guarding this Got one. Got it. Because um, they would do that uh, between villages. Mm -hmm. And villages could have been like 100 yards apart or it could have been 10 miles apart. At that time, the belief of the Choctaw was the, uh, the power of the medicine men had a role in the game. If you've ever seen in, a, um, in some of the photos of the little bitty sticks from a long time ago, the conjurers would use those and they would use those to try to bring the ball and, or to give good fortune to, the, to their fellow players to, to win. And those were all things that were part of the game. Another story about drum is that, uh, and how it affects the players, is that when a, when a baby is in the womb of the mother, the sound that he's familiar with is the heartbeat of the mother. And when the mother is excited, the heartbeat goes faster. Or when she's calm and serene, the heartbeat gets slower. And so he's affected by the mother. And being a matrilineal society, we were really respected mom and so when they were born they have a sensitivity to that sound and so the drummers play that two to one beat of the drum just like the heart of a human being so they connect to motherhood they connect to mother earth and it makes them it makes them uh, prepare for war it makes them prepare to be aggressive to do what they have to do to win and so it's much like modern sports today. You have to have something to motivate you, something to make you want to win. And so this is how the Choctaws believed. And so when the drummers play today, it's, it's to boost the, the, uh, the player to give his best. When they came to Oklahoma, um, when they b began the Trail of Tears, they brought the game with them. As we come to Oklahoma, you know, stickball was used more for entertainment than it was for settling disputes, um, for doing, you know, business. It, it didn't have such a strong role um, in the internal politics that it used to have, but it was still a way the community got together. So instead of being, you know, a sport focused on you know, keeping the men fit and ready, you know, for war, it more turned into a social interaction, of a sport. You know, due to colonization and a lot of other things, especially with allotment in the 1900s, we weren't able to live the way that we used to live. You know, we weren't able to live communally. We weren't able to practice um, the different things that we did because, um, you know, the, the government didn't want us doing those things anymore. 
the game kind of fell to the to the backside. And then you, you add pressures from um, early statehood in Oklahoma and the early beginning of, of the um, you know, a state police and, um, and federal jurisdiction here in Oklahoma, as that started to develop in the Oklahoma Territory, things like resources and reserved rights for the tribe was no longer in control of the tribe. It fell under federal jurisdiction. There was a uh, law passed on no longer to be able to play stickball games on Sunday. And eventually a law passed where you could no longer play um, communities, um, different communities, because you, you know, things like that began to, you couldn't do in, out in the open. Um, so our east-west games, so our games against the Chikasas that we would play, we no longer could do that. And so all that stuff um, really, and, and then new sports coming along, the development of sports like softball and baseball and native kids being sent to boarding schools, being sent to Carlisle, you know, the, the Carlisle Indian School, all those places um, really created a separation from being able to, to form teams, local teams. You know, the, the government didn't want us doing those things anymore. And so as our communities are broken up, um, so is our stickball communities too. And, you know, there were still others that still made sticks. There were others that still had games, but it wasn't on the level of what it used to be um, up until later. After the surrounding communities have held their own practices, it was now time for the Tushkahoma co-ed team to hit the road for the first time since the World Series. It's the Alabama Cushadas uh, hold a tournament in October every year. It's held in Livingston, Texas. It's a long drive from here. You know, it's a, it's a co-ed tournament. We got men and women playing and rules a little different. You know, we can't tackle the women Sometimes the, the, the rules on the, uh, that'll change. Sometimes the women, uh, they can tackle us. Sometimes they can uh, just grab our sticks. Uh, men, sometimes we can't grab their sticks. We just got to stand there. Um, it's a little different because you got to you gotta kind of remember that. And it's hard to do that when you got the adrenaline going, especially if the ball's coming right at you. It's fun. You know, that creates... Uh, that that fellowship, that friendship. Uh, you know, you want to spend more time with them. You want to you want to help them out where they where you can. And you know, when you step on that field, you know that's the first one first one you go up to help. I like having a, uh, a larger family that might not exactly be blood. Um, it's refreshing uh, to have that bond with other people that you might not have grown up with. Oh yeah, touch the home away. <laughs> Make it to the championship game, but would finish runner up. No, I think we did pretty good. We had some old timers out there, we got a lot of young, young ones out there, small guys. Uh, uh, and real fast, the speed was looking good. 
out there first couple of games and one of one of my uh, one of our boys who, who was we were relying on for speed and and his shooting ability he got hurt so he had taken out of the tournament and that, that really hurt us. It was a late hit though. So how long are you gonna be out, Chris? Rest of the season. Rest of the season. Mm -hmm. right. One minute. Fortunately, there was a commitment by certain individuals and who to continue to make the sticks, you know, the, those who kept our language, who kept our stories, who kept our sticks, you know, they carried that forward for us. My name is Folsom White. I'm the son of Sidney White and Mary White. My dad was born uh, October 22nd, 1888, and married my mother in February of 1958, but he was... Uh, he was still very active and energetic, uh, possessed a sharp mind, uh, suffered from chronic arthritis, but it didn't keep him from working and doing what he loved to do. And that was making these. Probably as a young boy growing up, I didn't even appreciate then the passion that he had for the game and the 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 work and the craftsmanship that goes in to making these sticks. The game never really, never really died out in Oklahoma as much as it has kind of slept for a short time. And our community members still played the game, you know, they just didn't do it out in the open, you know, so you hear stories about playing in the dark and that, you know, they would all clap when they hear a ding, you know, down there. So someone scored and everyone, then all of a sudden, you know, someone scored when you hear that ding at night. And, he would say whenever he would make a white ball or an extremely light colored ball, he said uh, that's what they would use to play at night. You know, you can just imagine under a moonlit sky and just hearing the breath of, you know, another person running, you know, and it just, um, you, you can you can probably, I, I hear stories out at Durwood, you can still hear, you know, um, the people out there and stuff like that. Anytime that there was, it, the Choctaw Nation had any kind of an event going on, say, with McAllister or Atoka or Broken Bow or anywhere. Um, if we could get there, Daddy always had, you know, a number of, of pairs of sticks. And I can remember whenever I was a young boy, just 10, 11, 12 years old, if he could just get any group of kids interested and teach them a little bit about how to use the sticks and work them together and show them a few things and and he just he just let us play. Yeah. So but, but that's the kind of man my dad was. So you know, that's what they had to do to keep it going. Um, but that commitment, you know, people like Sidney White willing to share stick making with other people and Cleland Billy and you know, putting together an effort in the nineteen seventies to teach other individuals in the community, going and picking people up. I remember when we went to Washington in 76, uh, like I said, all the five civilized tribes were represented. Cleland Billy was our coach, and of course, the chief and his wife and family there, and the chief at the time was David Gardner. What we were instructed to do was to uh, was to try to put on a good show for the public, and whenever they expressed interest, you know, if they... If we were to make ourselves available to, to talk to them and if they, uh, you know, if they wanted to look at sticks or whatever, you know, we were we were to, just to make ourselves available and try to explain as best we could. I have some very fond memories of that, that those few days in Washington. My uncle uh, was employed with the tribe at that time, and so he said they're having a five tribes sick ball tournament in we want uh, your group to come play uh, to represent the Choctaw. There's a photograph of some of the players that were in that uh, group. We beat the Cherokees first, and then we uh, played the Seminoles in the final, and, and, and our players uh, won that game also, so that, that's how we ended up being uh, winners of the Five Tribes Tournament. This is uh, me, Curtis Billy, and this is my son, Mahali, uh, Brian Mahali. Today, he's 45 years old. Um, 
Um, my dad taught me how to make sticks. Um, back then, um, it was an extra income. My dad, he used to be a welder, and whenever he worked shutdowns, he would be let go for a period of time. So you know, it was always to keep providing for the family. So we would have you know, buyers uh, that liked the game, people who played the game, people who admired the game back then, even then. Uh, I got started in making sticks here in Broken Bow in 1976. At the time, I was about five years old. By the time um, I was a freshman in high school, I had a, a history teacher ask me to do some kind of report, and I didn't know what I was gonna do it over. And, uh, I figured out I'd do it over Choctaw stickball making. So I made a pair of sticks for her for an A, for her grade. And uh, that was my very first pair of sticks I've ever made. And I, you know, I handed it to her so I could keep my A. But uh, that, that, that's what got me started. And ever since then, you know, that, that had to be back in 1986 when I started doing it on my own. And it's something that we've uh, done for, for years. Went from my great uncle to my dad to me uh, now to my son. So, you know, there's four generations that have always made Choctaw stickball sticks here in Oklahoma. So, trying to get a, I guess a stove, cement block stove, so we can set this pot of water on top of it so we can start burning uh, some timber and start to build a steam. Uh, my first pair of sticks I made was I think I was 15 or 16 years old. Then after that, when I started going on my own, I started just remembering what dad did and asking him questions and this and that. And then I actually started doing my own. And then within recent years, I developed a lot more stuff, tools and techniques. I was like, oh, this works better or this does this better. And it was really, really awesome, really unique. Just perfecting the craft. satisfaction of making the sticks and uh, watching the players play with them or, or even me playing with them. You know, it, it's always a, a part of your family, part of you, part of your culture and heritage. It's so much rooted in our past. You know, it's, it's got its, its roots. It's like a tree, you know, a, a tree, it's got its roots in the past, but that tree grows and it's got many branches. And, you know, one branch is there in Mississippi, one branch is here in Oklahoma but we're all from that same tree, you know, and, and from that tree, those sticks, we make those sticks. And so I think Curtis Billy makes a great point talking about, you know, this is Choctaw Stickball. The game uh, we play at Durant, during the powwow, we've got Ossie Healy and uh, Thunder. Those are two divisions uh, in uh, Team Tuscahoma. They're gonna go against each other out there yeah, there's always some smack talking, but that adds to the game when they get out there. They, they, they don't want to lose. One team does not want to lose to the other. And, and so so it does get pretty pretty intense out there. They don't fight or nothing, but they get out there and they, they, want, to, they want to play to win.
it's a good battle. Uh, they wage against each other out here on the field, but then uh, but when it's over, it's over. We are brothers again. We are brothers and sisters again. You can see uh, uh, see where individuals are, are really working on their on their skill set. That means the young ones are really learning to play with the, the intensity of a man's game. Uh, when the men are out there playing, they you know they're out there fighting tooth and nail. So the, the young people coming out of youth leagues uh, have to learn that intensity, and uh, and it's really coming along. The youth league movement began in Broken Bow under the direction of Stanley Shomo. The Boys and Girls Club, they had wrote a grant. And stickball was part of that grant. So I went and talked to Jared Tom Pinty, and me and him got together and formed several teams, formed our field that's over there. It's about done whenever they get through. We'll be over there with the junior team practicing, okay? We didn't have names or jerseys, but we just had them come out here and play. Then that following year, Choctaw Nation found out about it. They was able to give each team, because they went to other towns, like to Durant, Hugo, and Telehina. And they was able to create teams there. And Choctaw Nation gave each team so much money to help with equipment, with uniforms, with travel expenses. <laughs> all right, where we're from in Wolverton, it's all about basketball, baseball, and football, and softball. No one really knows about stickball. All right, and some people want to play and learn it, but they're just intimidated by how physical it gets. They just don't understand the game, really. So that's what, that was my way of introducing it to the community. It's gonna get bigger. It's just gonna get it's just gonna get bigger, greater, and more people will come out. What you're trying to do is you're trying to build these youth up so that they, in the future, will become a part of Team Tuscahoma. The kids understand what they are representing. We tell them every time that whether they're on or off that field, whether they're in public or on the weekend, they are representing their tribe or, or our Choctaw culture. It's a blessing and it's, it's it just makes your heart so happy inside to know that you took part in helping to raise a stickball player from a youth to a, an adult team player. I had four sons and three of them, we all played together at the Durant game. But my oldest, he travels year round with us. So with him playing and me playing, it's, I love it. I can't express my feelings for it. It's just something that you know that I enjoy. It's important for parents to expose their children to different different aspects of their culture because it's good for their self identity. It's good for their self esteem. You know, through stickball, kids are able to root themselves in part of their identity. And you know, maybe they have broken homes. Maybe they have you know issues in their lives that they suffer from but stickball is a way that they can um, push through that. And it adds that perseverance, you know, to them. They can take that out into the world to combat the stresses that we deal with every day that tell us who we should be and who we shouldn't be. And those things cause us to have a negative self-image. And when you already have that core sense of pride about who you are and where you come from, that's a tool or a weapon that you can use to combat that.
And then eventually around 2010, there was a event of getting a new stickball team to be integrated or to be a part of the World Series of Stickball. Josh Willis came up uh, from Mississippi and he had some kin folks on the, on the commission. And, uh, and he said that, he told the uh, chief and Sue that we could get the get a team together. I came down to Mississippi, back to Mississippi to talk to Beasley Denson. He was a tribal chief then. So when I came down to talk to him, I asked him if it was okay if, we could, if I could bring a team in from Oklahoma. Uh, he kept saying that, um, that they probably can't because never, we never had an outside team come in from another state. So I didn't hear nothing, nothing then, so I came back the third time. And I talked to him, and that's where I had tribal council come in there and talk to Beasley. And he said, he'll let me know. A couple of weeks later, I got a phone call saying, that, hey, your team's approved. You can bring a team down. And so he went up there and got it started. And once it got rolling, you know, it went up to, uh, I think, Sue, and it just took off from there. And the higher ups got involved, and we were invited, and that's how we got to go. Then about 30 days before that tournament, I said, I said, yeah, get the team, get the team together, go play at Mississippi. So I said, okay. <laughs> so we started trying to, trying to draw in as many guys as we could to get to get to play. And many of them, some of them, they never played before. It was a lot to learn. <laughs> I mean, they knew how to throw and catch, but it was. Mostly uh, the basics of scooping it up, just running and scooping it, and throwing behind them and be quick about it. The team was known as the Oklahoma Chop Dogs, or OK Chop Dogs. We were a little bit uh, inexperienced because we'd never played that type of ball game before which we've played over here and it's totally different. As I believe there's a more physical tackling style over here. Uh, the skills is not as great as, you know, we're just now started up, but when you go over there, they got great skills. They move, they don't have to tackle because they move so fast. They can run, they can pass. None of us really had the chance to hit anyone or tackle like that. And so it was almost like worthless, you know, because when we play it in Oklahoma, we hit each other. We would run the ball, we would try to run through people, Today they call it a suicide, and so that was a rough lesson to learn <laughs> over three or four years <laughs> to grasp that concept and actually apply it. And that's what it takes to play stickball. You got to work on your work on the skill set uh, all the time. Every year we've improved, gotten better and better every year. I went to go down, pick up the ball, and I flicked it behind me, and that's when I got hit. So I had, I didn't even have the ball anymore. Because he couldn't see where the ball went. But it was, it's a late hit, but whether he could see where the ball was or not, it just, it's part of the game. It's tore ligaments, tendons, and a separation. Right when it happened, what, it, what went through your head? I was like, it's done, I'm done. <laughs> I was like, nope. <laughs> it was hard, it, it sucked. Because I wanted to be out there, I wanted to get out there. Just couldn't do it. Some keychains that I did, just came up with, and do a lot of beating. I can't do much. So I just started beating, and this is what I did. I just finally got to where I got two months of physical therapy, and if that doesn't get any better, then I have to have surgery. I hope to be back by July for the World Series. Over the next few months, as Chris recovers, his teammates continue to practice.
the tournament just days away, Brenner Billy leads one of the practices in Broken Bow. Uh, we a community, we, we a family. Pretty much all of us, we are family. So when we're out there on the field, you know, that's who we got. And everyone from this community, from this district, you know, we're together all the time. Even if we're 100 miles away, a couple hundred miles, we still come here today and we still practice with each other. And even our additional family coming from, you know, from Durant as well and from all parts of Tallahanna and uh, all the districts. For, he for us, this is, you know, the home of the culture, home of stickball. For us in Oklahoma, I think, you know, it's something that we need to grow it because we're still growing. And remember why we play. If we don't play today, then who will play tomorrow? We, we see it as competition, but to me it's much more deeper than that. Your kids, your, your legacy, what you're leaving behind, is what you're doing. I say remember that. <laughs> Meanwhile in Mississippi, the tournament bracket selection is taking place. Number two, number two. Well, we get a first round by. That's always good. Number nine, number nine. But we play the winner of Tully and Pearl River. Yeah. Tully, we play them. We play them throughout the year several times. They're a pretty good team. And Pearl River, that's one of the top dogs in, in Mississippi. So they've won it a couple years ago. You know, they got, a lot of their teammates are friends of ours and we know how good they are, so. But we'll be ready. So coming into this game, we knew Konata was going to be a tough team to beat. They play really well together, and that's just the characteristics of a championship team. Konihata Ohoyo was the defending champs, but Tushkahoma Ohoyo was confident. So as we line up and the drums start beating, we start banging our sticks together with the drum beat to get ourselves hyped up. Um, your adrenaline just goes through the roof as you start walking in the gate. The sounds of the drums when you're coming in and the feel of the air, it's heavier down here. Your heart starts to beat with the drum. You just get in this uh, mindset and you know what you have to do and you know what could happen. And you push all that to the back of your head and you get out there and you just play as hard as you can for as long as you can.
When we started, we had some confusion on which end of the field our shooters were on. We were initially told that we were supposed to shoot on one side of the field. There ended up being a miscommunication. All of our shooters realized that we were playing defense. And in that moment, there are no timeouts. So two of our shooters got on the pole to defend the pole and the rest of us just adjusted and played defense. Among the whole chaos, we were just, we were trying to play the game that we know how to play. We just had to uh, adjust and um, make it work. Just seconds into the game, Coney Hatta would take advantage and strike first. The team would fight back, but the momentum had already shifted. After one quarter, Coney had a Hoyo had a commanding lead. Thank you okay, for your that way, cooperation. You get to the mall, scoop it back, okay? Also, if you have back. any raffles, 50-50 chances. It's a not a play area, so please watch your children. Also, you can use three. Two days later, the men's team arrived. Meanwhile, at Warrior Stadium, the tournament continues. Earlier in the tournament, Pearl River defeated Chikasha Tully from Oklahoma. They now play Tushkahoma. Take balls on this side, y'all two go around, you step out, you go that side, y'all right here. The pressure's on us to win this game, because we got to score. If we don't score, we ain't going to win. It's that simple. 
I think defense looks good. Yeah, it was uh, real physical, beginning of the game. Everybody's hopped up, ready to play. So, you know, that's, it was just going back and forth. We've seen some of our players get out or get kicked out. They hit a couple on us real quick and it kind of brought us down a little bit, but we stayed 
We stayed in fighting. It does get us down, but you know, I've been a captain for a while and I would just try to get the defense back up, back in position because you now we're trying to go four quarters with them. Go pose for the river leading by four points. We're in the third quarter of play in this single elimination tournament. Uh, after every loss, frustration as, as being a captain and now a coach that we need to get the whole team there and a lot of practices we don't and it shows on the field. But we did look good. Three quarters of the game, we played good. It was just that one quarter that always gets us. We just gotta work harder to play in Mississippi. You know, it's an honor, it's, we like it. I love it. You know, it's always a good day to play Choctaw stickball. You know, someone will ask you, how do you, how do you describe stickball? And I'm like, well, uh, it's rugby, it's football, it's basketball, it's soccer, it's lacrosse, it's all these things in one. And, you know, they don't really know how to comprehend that until they see it. And that's a way that I can still honor my ancestors. Um, and it's a way that we, as a people, can hold something close that has never been touched by Western society. Stickball itself is pure. It's something that, you know, if we wanted to revitalize stickball, if we wanted to make improvements, we did that. Another influence coming in didn't do that. What does stickball mean to me? It, it means everything. It, it's, it's part of my identity as a Choctaw person.